they'll come to the fullness of truth about themselves. Cardinal Ratzinger was, of course, prefect of the, doctrine, of the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith for Pope John Paul II. And although we don't know his precise contribution to Fides et Ratio, we can see it as an expression of his own theological interests and as a background to the remarks he made at Regensburg. And as I mentioned, uh, the University of Regensburg was the setting for this address. Benedict himself was a professor at the universities of Bonn, Munster, Tübingen, and Regensburg before he became a bishop, cardinal, and Vatican official. And throughout his life, he was engaged in academic writing and research and scholarship. And so we can see that the Regensburg Address proceeds from a long ex experience and a deep love of the intellectual and the academic life. And Benedict uh, begins uh, the address by recalling his early days in academia. It is a moving experience for me to be back in the university and be able once again to give a lecture at this podium. I think back to those years when, after a pleasant period, at the Friesinger Hulk School, I began teaching at the University of Bonn. That was in 1959, in the days of the old university made, of, made up of ordinary professors. The various chairs had neither assistants nor secretaries, but in recompense, there was much direct contact with students and in particular among the professors themselves. We would meet before and after lessons in the rooms of the teaching staff. There was a lively interchange with historians, philosophers, <clears throat> and naturally between the two theological faculties. Once a semester, there was a dies uh, academicus when professors from every faculty ap appear before the students of the entire university, making possible a genuine experience of universitas. Universitas, a Latin word, meaning the whole, the universe, and in Roman law, a corporation. And he says, uh, this experience, in other words, of the fact that despite our specializations, which at times make it difficult to communicate with each other, we made up a whole, working in everything on the basis of a single rationality with its various aspects and sharing responsibility for the right use of reason. This reality became a lived experience. The university was also very proud of its two theological faculties. That is, it had both a, a Catholic and a Protestant faculty. It is clear that by inquiring about the reasonableness of faith, they too carried out a work which is necessarily part of the whole of the Universitas Scientiarum, the University of Sciences, even if not everyone could share the faith which theologians seek to correlate with reason as a whole. This profound sense of coherence within the universe of reason was not troubled, even when it was once reported that a colleague had said that there was something odd about our university. It had two faculties devoted to something that did not exist, namely God. Uh, this is a little example of Benedict's sense of humor. Uh, but, but I think there's also a serious point here. As you can see, um, the uh, chaplain at Harvard University is now an atheist, and so maybe they, <clears throat> Harvard takes, likes to take things seriously. But, um, but I think that uh, you know, even an atheist can talk about God or the non-existence of God, and uh, will have something to contribute to the to the conversation. So even in the face of such radical skepticism, it is still necessary and reasonable to raise the question of God through the use of reason, and to do so in the context of the tradition of the Christian faith. This within the university as a whole was accepted without question. And he says, I was reminded of all this recently when I read the edition by Professor Theodore Quarry of Munster of part of a dialogue carried on perhaps in 1391 in the winter barracks near Ankara by the erudite Byzantine emperor, Manuel II Paleologus, need, um, who was uh, the emperor from 1391 to uh, 1495. And he had a, a, a dialogue with an educated Persian 
on the subject of Christianity and Islam and the truth of both. It was presumably the emperor himself who set down this dialogue during the siege of Constantinople between 1394 and 1402. And this would explain why his arguments are given in greater detail than those of his Persian interlocutor. The dialogue ranges widely over the structures of faith contained in the Bible and in the Quran, and deals especially with the image of God and of man, while necessarily returning repeatedly to the relationship between, as they are now called, three laws or rules of life, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Quran. It is not my intention to discuss this question in the present lecture. Here, I would like to discuss only one point, itself rather marginal to the dialogue as a whole, which in the context of the issue of faith and reason, I found interesting and which can serve as a starting point for my reflections on this issue. In the seventh dialogue, edited by, edited by Professor Corey, the emperor touches on the theme of holy war. The emperor must have known that Sora 2, 256 reads, there is no compulsion in religion. Accordingly to some of the experts, this is probably one of the uh, Soras of the early period when Muhammad was still powerless and under threat. But naturally the emperor also knew the instructions developed later and recorded in the Quran concerning holy war. Without descending to details, such as the difference in treatment accorded to those who have the book and the infidels, he addresses his interlocutor with a startling brusqueness, a brusqueness which we find unacceptable on the central question about the relationship between religion uh, and violence in general, saying, show me just what Muhammad brought that was new, and there you will find things only evil and inhuman, such as his command to spread by the sword the faith he preached. The emperor, after having expressed himself so forcefully, goes on to explain in detail the reasons why spreading the faith through violence is something unreasonable. Violence is incompatible with the nature of God and the nature of the soul. God, he says, is not pleased by blood and not acting reasonably, soon logo, is contrary to God's nature. Faith is born of a soul, not the body. Whoever would lead someone to faith needs the ability to speak well and to reason properly without violence and threats. To convince a reasonable soul, one does not need a strong arm or weapons of any kind or any other means of threatening a person with death. Well, this was the, uh, the really controversial part of the speech, uh, quoting the Byzantine emperor uh, about uh, uh, Muhammad. And uh, of course, by, uh, you know, it didn't just come out of the blue. Benedict knew that he was being um, uh, uh, provocative in a sense, and he certainly was not trying to incite, incite violence uh, against Christians. But on the other hand, he, it was certainly an issue in the world, as we can see from the events of September 11, 2001, uh, which those of us who were alive at the time will never forget, and uh, the, the attack on the World Trade Center and also the Pentagon in Washington. And also the uh, 2004, the next slide, the, these, um, these conflicts between uh, 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 Muslims and especially Muslims uh, 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 committing acts of violence against uh, uh, not just Christians, but uh, Europeans in general. This was the uh, murder of a th uh, filmmaker Theo van Gogh uh, in 2004 on the streets of Amsterdam. And, uh, and then in 2005, there, were, <laughs> there was a famous Danish cartoon controversy where a, a, a Danish newspaper uh, ran a series of cartoons about Muhammad. And uh, this is an example of one of those cartoons where they've run out of the virgins that the suicide bombers are supposed to enjoy in heaven. So Muhammad is telling them they have to stop. Uh, so you can see it's, um, uh, you know, I mean, it's, 
I guess it, it would be offensive to suicide bombers, but it's, you know, not really a very blasphemous kind of cartoon. But anyway, it created a lot of controversy, and uh, Muslims around the world got upset about these cart cartoons and beheaded people and did all sorts of things. So Benedict knew he was uh, raising an issue which had uh, a contemporary resonance. Um, at the same time, um, you know, he was obviously did it in a way that, um, uh, you know, was, was you know, uh, referring to, you know, a rather distant historical event and, uh, you know, in a very, and, and again, in a very measured way. But still, people got upset about it and um, there were protests against Benedict and even, um, you know, even violence against cr Christians throughout the Middle East um, because of it. He goes on, the decisive statement in this argument against violence, violent conversion is this, not to act in accordance with reason is contrary to God's nature. The editor, Theodore Corey, observes, for the emperor as a Byzantine shaped by Greek philosophy, the statement is self-evident. But for Muslim teaching, God is absolutely transcendent. His will is not bound up with any of our categories, even that of rationality. Here, Corey quotes a work of the noted French uh, Islamicist, uh, Roger Aldenez, uh, next uh, slide, um, who points out that Ibn Hazim, uh, who uh, was a uh, uh, Andalusian uh, Muslim theologian um, who lived around 1000, went so far as to state that God is not bound even by his own word and that nothing would oblige him to reveal the truth to us. Were it God's will, we would even have to practice idolatry. At this point, as far as understanding of God and thus the concrete practice of religion is concerned, we are faced with an unavoidable dilemma. Is the conviction that acting unreasonably contradicts God's nature merely a Greek idea, or is it always and intrinsically true? I believe, Benedict says, that here we can see the profound harmony between what is Greek in the best sense of the word and the biblical understanding of faith in God. Modifying the first verse of the book of Genesis, the first verse of a whole Bible, John begins the prologue of his, of his gospel with the words, in the beginning was the Logos. This is the very word used by the emperor. God acts soon logo, with Logos. Logos means both reason and word. A reason which is creative and capable of self-communication, precisely as reason. John thus spoke the final word on the biblical concept of God. And in this word, all the often toilsome and torturous threads of biblical faith find their culmination and synthesis. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos is God, says the evangelist. The encounter between the biblical message and Greek thought did not happen by chance. The vision of St. Paul, who saw the roads to Asia barred and in a dream saw a Macedonian man plead with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. This is from the book of Acts. This vision can be interpreted as a distillation of the intrinsic necessity of a rapprochement between biblical faith and Greek inquiry. In point of fact, this rapprochement has been going on for some time. The mysterious name of God revealed from the burning bush, <laughs> there's the burning bush, <laughs> uh, Exodus 3, um, and where God reveals his name to Moses, I am who am. A name which separates God from all other divinities with their many names and simply asserts being. I am already presents a challenge to the notion of myth to which Socrates' attempt to vanquish and transcend myth stands in close analogy. Uh, there we see Socrates, the, uh, uh, the great Greek philosopher. Uh, what we know of Socrates, of course, uh, comes primarily from uh, 
uh, Socrates himself wrote, didn't write anything, but from Plato's dialogues and also from uh, some other works of, uh, um, uh, of the uh, fourth and fifth centuries. Uh, but um, the, uh, w w when we, at least Socrates is presented by Plato, uh, has a, a rather complicated relationship with myth. He, uh, he, he's scandalized by the immorality of the, uh, the, the, the behavior of the gods in, uh, in Greek mythology. But at the same time, he's also always quoting the poets, and uh, even though he would exclude them from his republic. And he also invents myths himself uh, on occasion to, uh, uh, to give uh, 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 expression to, uh, to some of his philosophical ideas. So this is, as Benedict says, uh, an attempt both to uh, vanquish the, uh, the common idea of myth, but also transcend it and present it in, uh, in a way that is more in harmony with reason. Within the Old Testament, um, the process which started at the burning bush came to a new maturity at the time of the exile. So this is uh, around uh, uh, 600 BC, when the God of Israel, uh, an Israel now deprived of its land and worship, was proclaimed as the God of heaven and earth and described in a simple formula which echoes the words entered at the burning bush, I am. And I think Benedict is here thinking of uh, the words of uh, the prophet Isaiah. For example, uh, thus says the Lord, uh, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no other God. This new understanding of God is, accomplished, is, is accompanied rather by a kind of enlightenment which finds stark expression in the mockery of gods who are merely the work of human hands. And again, this is from Psalm 115. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver, silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Thus, despite the bitter conflict with those Hellenistic rulers <clears throat> who sought uh, to accommodate it forcibly to the customs and idolatrous cult of the Greeks, Biblical faith in the Hellenistic period, that is from the death of Alexander the Great in 323 to the death of Cleopatra around, uh, in, well, in, in of 30 BC. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, um, biblical faith encountered the best of Greek thought at a deep level resulting in a mutual enrichment, evident especially in the later wisdom literature. And this was a period especially when Greek came to be spoken uh, all throughout the Middle East and in Israel. And of course, there was the famous uh, Old Testament uh, translation of uh, into Greek known as the Septuagint, which was done at Alexandria beginning in around the um, um, uh, third century BC. And the Septuagint is more than a simple, and in that sense, Benedict says, less than satisfactory translation of the Hebrew text. It is, it is an independent textual witness and a distinct and important step in the history of Revelation, one which brought about this encounter in a way that was decisive for the birth and spread of Christianity. And those of you who are into biblical studies will know that in recent years, the, uh, um, the value of the Septuagint as, a, um, as an independent source for, uh, uh, for the books of the Bible has uh, been you know, more deeply appreciated. And of course, especially for those books which are, uh, are written primarily in Greek. And a profound encounter um, of faith and reason is taking place here, an encounter between genuine enlightenment and religion. From the very heart of Christian faith, and at the same time the heart of Greek thought, now joined to faith, Manuel II was able to say, 
not to act with logos is contrary to God's nature. We have, oh, there's the Septuagint right there. Uh, <clears throat> in all honesty, one must observe that in the late Middle Age ages, uh, we find trends in theology which would sunder this synthesis between the Greek spirit and the Christian spirit. In contrast with the so-called, the next slide, intellectualism of August, St. Augustine, this is Augustine here, oh, let's go back a second. This is Augustine here on the right. You can see he has a pet cat, for those of you who are into cats. Um, and Thomas Aquinas, who should have a dog because Dominicans have dogs, right? That's a, <laughs> but uh, both, both Augustine and Aquinas were profoundly uh, influenced by, uh, by Greek thought. Augustine, of course, primarily by Plato, uh, Thomas by, by Aristotle, uh, but they, uh, they had a, that sense of the, uh, the Greek tradition in their approach to, uh, um, uh, uh, to theology. Uh, in contrast, Dun Scotus, who's our next one, a uh, Franciscan uh, theologian um, of the uh, uh, 13th century, um, tended toward a, a voluntarism, that is a philosophy of the will, as opposed to the intellect, uh, which opened the way to later developments and led to the claim that we can only know God's voluntas ordinata, that is, what God has decided his will is, uh, but, but theoretically there are other possibilities. And there we, William of Ockham, William of Ockham uh, another Franciscan theologian in the next century, developed this even further. Uh, William said, uh, the ways of God are not open to reason, for God has freely chosen to create a world and establish a way of salvation within it, apart from any necessary laws that human logic or rationality can uncover. So this again, you know, is approaching what, um, you know, this absolute transcendence of God where uh, he doesn't even have to be bound by, uh, by reason. Um, he, can, uh, he can do whatever he wants and he may have decided some things, but he could have decided something else and there would not be any reason why he couldn't. Um, beyond this is the realm of God's freedom in virtue of which he could have done the opposite of everything he has actually done, Benedict says. This gives rise to positions which clearly approach those of Ibn Hazam and might even lead to the image of a capricious God who is not even bound to truth and goodness. God's transcendence and otherness are so exalted that our reason, our sense of the true and the good are no longer an authentic mirror of God whose deepest possibilities remain eternally unattainable and hidden behind his actual decisions. As opposed to this, the faith of the church has always insisted that between God and us, between his eternal creative, creator spirit and our created reason, there exists a real analogy. Analogy, the process of reasoning uh, by comparison, but not uh, identity, uh, in which, as the uh, Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 stated, unlikeness remains infinitely greater than likeness, yet not to the point of abolishing analogy and its language. God does not, and there we have the, uh, Michelangelo's uh, uh, famous uh, painting of assist from the Sistine Chapel of, of the creation, of man, God does not become more divine when we push him away from us in a sheer impenetrable volunteerism. Rather, the truly divine God is the God who has revealed himself as Logos and as Logos has acted and continues to act lovingly on our behalf. The God who creates us, the God who in the incarnation becomes one of us. Certainly love, as St. Paul says, transcends knowledge, and is thereby capable of perceiving more than thought alone. Paul said, to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. 
Nonetheless, it continues to be the love of God who is Logos. Consequently, Christian worship is, again to quote St. Paul, logike latria, that is worship in harmony with the eternal word and with our reason, the a rational or a spiritual worship. In Romans, Paul said, I beseech you, brethren, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, your rational worship. This inner rapprochement between biblical faith and Greek philo philosophical inquiry was an event of decisive importance, not only from the standpoint of the history of religions, but also from that of world history. It is an event which concerns us even today. Given this convergence, it is not surprising that Christianity, despite its origins and some significant developments in the East, finally took on its historically decisive character in Europe. We can also express this the other way around, this convergence with the subsequent addition of the Roman heritage created Europe and remains the foundation of what can rightly be called Europe. The thesis that the critically purified Greek heritage forms an integral part of Christian faith has been countered by the call for a de-Hellenization, getting rid of the Greek influence of Christianity a call which has more and more dominated theological discussions since the beginning of the modern age. Viewed more closely, three stages, stages can be observed in this program of de-Hellenization. Although interconnected, they're clearly distinct from one another in their motivations and object ob objectives. The first stage, the Reformation, everybody's uh, <clears throat> next slide, everybody's favorite Augustinian, Martin Luther, right? You know. <clears throat> De-Hellenization first emerges in connection with the postulates of the Reformation in the 16th century. Looking at the tradition of scholastic theology, the reformers thought they were confronted with a faith system totally conditioned by philosophy. That is to say, an articulation of the faith based on an alien system of thought. As a result, faith no longer appeared to, as a living historical word, but as one element of an overarching philosophical system. The principle of sola scriptura, only scripture, on the other hand, sought faith, sola fides, in its pure primordial, primordial form, as originally found in the biblical word. So this was, you know, Luther and to an even greater extent, you know, uh, some of the other reformers were, wanted to strip away all philosophy uh, from, uh, from and separate uh, faith and ground it si uh, uh, simply in scripture without uh, the uh, 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 apparatus of, uh, of philosophical uh, inquiry. Metaphysics appeared as a premise derived from another source from which faith had to be liberated in order to become more fully itself. And here, uh, Immanuel Kant, the great philosopher of the Enlightenment, um, Kant's, uh, well, Kant's thinking about anything is very complex and especially about religion, but he did separate um, religion from, uh, from, from pure reason. And uh, his, uh, his thought on religion is, uh, is grounded in, in practical reason. And he wrote a, a collection of essays called uh, uh, The um, uh, religion within the limitations of bare reason. That is, he wanted to confine uh, the, uh, the thought and study of re uh, religion simply to, uh, to man's rationality, not to historical, not to revealed truth, not even to the Bible. So uh, he had some difficulties with the <laughs> church in his day, but uh, uh, was uh, maybe a... Um, uh, you know, uh, 
an, another example of this dehellenization that, uh, that was going on. When Kant stated that he needed to set aside uh, thinking in order to make room for faith, he carried this program forward with a radicalism that the reformers could never have foreseen. He thus anchored faith, faith exclusively in practical reason, denying it to access, uh, access to reality as a whole. The uh, second stage of dehellenization, Benedict says, uh, and I call this the quest for the historical Jesus, which uh, was actually the name of a book uh, by Albert Schweitzer, the uh, famous uh, theologian and uh, organist and Alsatian <laughs> and medical doctor and missionary, uh, a, a very wonderful man. Uh, but uh, uh, Benedict uh, talks about uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the German theologian Alfred von Harnack and he says the liberal theology of the 19th and 20th centuries ushered in a second stage in this process of dehellenization with Adolf von Harnack as its outstanding example. When, he, when I was a student, he says, in the early years of my teaching, this program was highly influential in Catholic theology. It took as its point of departure Pascal's distinction between the, uh, if we go on to Pascal, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph, and the God of the philosophers. Uh, Michael, if you want to show us Pascal next. There we are. No, there's Descartes. There we are. Okay. <laughs> We're a little uh, mixed up here. Pascal, the uh, great uh, French uh, mathematician and, and, and writer who, um, when he was struggling um, to, uh, uh, I mean, you know, f you know to, to be converted to a, to a deeper faith, um, you, know, you know, talked about the, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, and made a distinction between him, that living God, that God who appeals to our whole being, uh, our emotions as well as our intellect, and the God of the philosophers who is simply abstract and, and intellectual. And of course, it was uh, Pascal who said famously, um, the heart has its reasons, which, which, reasons, which reason itself does not uh, uh, comprehend or understand. Uh, so uh, again, he wasn't excluding reason from God, but saying there, there is a, a deeper, uh, 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 um, you know, the, 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 uh, the God of faith is something deeper than simply a God of, uh, of abstract reason. Uh, and actually, Benedict says in, in, my, in his inaugural lecture at Bonn in 1959, I tried to address this issue. And if any of you um, have a copy of Ratzinger's Introduction to Christianity, uh, that lecture is actually uh, the God of Faith and the God of the Philosophers, uh, chapter three in this book. Uh, but he doesn't when it gets, goes into a lot of detail about uh, the uh, uh, the use of reason in philosophy. And he says, "I do not intend to repeat here what I said on that occasion, but I would like to describe at least briefly what was new about the second stage of dehellenization." Harnack's central idea was to return simply to the man Jesus and to his simple message. Underneath the accretions of theology and indeed, um, and, and, um, indeed of Hellenization, this simple message was seen as the culmination of the religious development of humanity. Jesus was said to have put an end to worship in favor of morality. In the end, he was presented as the father of a humanitarian moral message. Fundamentally, Harnack's goal was to bring Christianity back into harmony with modern reason. There we have Harnack again. Um, liberating it, that is to say, from seemingly philosophical and theological elements, such as faith in Christ's divinity and the triune God. In other words, get rid of all the supernatural stuff 
uh, all the reasons we believe Jesus to be God, and, but talk about him as, you know, a nice guy and a wonderful teacher, that kind of thing. And in this sense, so you're looking at historical, critical exegesis of the New Testament, as he saw it, restored to theology its place within the university. Theology for Harnack is something essentially historical and therefore strictly scientific. So it's interesting, it was at this point that history too as a discipline um, you know, took its place within the academic faculties in the, uh, the 19th century. And Harnack wanted to make uh, theology historical, linguistic, um, uh, scientific in that sense, but not, uh, uh, not bound up with uh, you know, philosophical or uh, mystical terms. Well, it is able to say, what it is able to say critically about Jesus is, so to speak, an expression of practical reason and consequently it can take its rightful place within the university. And behind this thinking lies the modern self-limitation of reason, classically expressed in Kant's critiques, um, but in the meantime, further radicalized by the impact of the natural sciences. This modern concept of reason is based, to put it briefly, on a synthesis between Platonism, or Cartesianism, as he says, and there we have Rene Descartes. Uh, we did have Rene Descartes. There he is, the great uh, French mathematician and uh, uh, philosopher. Um, <clears throat> a synthesis confirmed by the success of uh, technology. On the one hand, it presupposes the mathematical structure of matter, its intrinsic rationality, which makes it possible to understand how matter works and use it efficiently. God speaks the language of mathematics, right? This basic pre premise is, so to speak, the platonic element in the modern understanding of nature. On the other hand, there is nature's capacity to be exploited for our purposes, and here only the possibility of verification or falsification through experimentation can yield decisive certainty. And this is uh, empiricism. The weight between the two poles can, depending on the circumstances, shift from one to the other. So as strongly a positive, positivistic thinker as um, um, Jacques Monod, this, he was a French bio, uh, biochemist uh, who won the Nobel Prize in medicine, but he was also a philosopher uh, uh, of, of, of materialism, uh, and his, his, uh, his main ph uh, philosophical work was called Chance and Necessity, uh, where he, uh, so he, again, had this idea of, um, of uh, the, uh, the world itself is only matter, but at the same time that matter can be understood through, uh, 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 through uh, mathematics and uh, uh, scientific method. And, and Monod has declared himself a convinced Platonist Cartesian. So the two go together in, uh, I mean, in a, in a paradoxical way, but also in a very deep and, and profound way. And this gives what rise to two principles which are crucial for the issue we have raised. First, only the kind of certainty resulting from the interplay of mathematical and empirical elements can be considered scientific. Anything that would claim to be science must be measured against this criterion. Hence, the human sciences, such as history, psychology, sociology, and philosophy, attempt to conform themselves to this canon of scientificity. A second point, which is important for our reflections, is that by its very nature, this method excludes the question of God making it appear as an unscientific or pre-scientific question. Consequently, we are faced with a reduction of the radius, radius of science and reason, one which needs to be questioned. I will refer to this problem later. In the meantime, it must be observed 
that from this standpoint, any attempt to maintain theology's claim to be scientific would end up reducing Christianity to a mere fragment of its former self. But we must say more. If science as a whole is this and this alone, then it is man himself who ends up being reduced. For the specifically human questions about our origin and destiny, the questions raised by religion and ethics then have no place within the purview of collective reason as defined by science, so understood, and thus uh, must be relegated to the realm of the subjective. The subject then decides on the basis of his experiences what he considers tenable in matters of religion and the subject of conscience becomes the sole arbiter of what is ethical. In this way though, ethics and religion lose their power to create a community and become a completely personal matter. This is a dangerous state of affairs for humanity and unfortunately that's where we are today as we can see from the disturbing pathologies of religion and reason, which necessarily erupt when reason is so reduced that questions of faith and ethics no longer concern it. Attempts to construct an ethic from the rules of evolution or from psychology and sociology end up being simply inadequate. Before I draw the conclusions to which all of this has been leading, I must briefly refer to a third stage of dehellenization, which is now in progress. In the light of our experiences uh, with cultural pluralism, it is often said that nowadays the synthesis, synthesis with Hellenism achieved in the early church was an initial enculturation which ought not to be binding on other cultures. Oh, there we have a little, little feminist humor. Uh, if everybody can see that, <laughs> enculturation, right? So, <laughs> depends on how you're looking at it, right? So, um, the, um, <clears throat> the latter, uh, these other cultures are said to have the right to return to the simple message of the New Testament prior to that enculturation in order to enculturate it anew in their own particular milieu. This thesis is not simply false, but it is coarse and lacking in precision. The New Testament was written in Greek and bears the imprint of the Greek spirit, which had already come to maturity as the Old Testament developed. True, there are elements in the evolution of the early church which do not have to be integrated into all cultures. Nonetheless, the fundamental decisions made about the relationship between faith and the use of human reason are part of the faith itself. They are developments consonant with the nature of the faith itself. And so I come to my conclusion. This attempt painted with, painted with broad strokes at a critique of modern reason from within has nothing to do with putting the clock back to the time before the Enlightenment and rejecting the insights of a modern age. The positive aspects of modernity are to be acknowledged unreservedly. We all like modern dentistry, right, you know, I think, <laughs> or at least compared to what went before. <laughs> we are all grateful for the marvelous possibilities that it has opened up for mankind and for the progress in humanity that has been granted to us. The scientific ethos, moreover, is the will to be obedient to the truth. And as such, it embodies an attitude which belongs to the essential decisions of the Christian spirit. The intention here is not one of retrenchment or negative criticism, but of broadening our concept of reason and its application. While we rejoice in the new possibilities open to humanity, we also see the dangers arising from these possibilities and must ask ourselves how we can overcome them. We will succeed in doing so only if reason and faith come together in a new way. If we overcome the self-imposed limitation of reason to the empirically falsifiable, and if we once more uh, 
uh, disclose its vast horizons. In this sense, theology rightly belongs in the university and within the wide-ranging dialogue of sciences, not merely as historical as a historical discipline and as one of the human sciences, but precisely as theology, as inquiry into the rationality of faith. Only thus do we become capable of that genuine dialogue of cultures and religions so urgently needed today. In the Western world, it is widely held that only positivistic reason and the forms of philosophy based on it are universally valid. Yet the world's profoundly religious cultures see this exclusion of the divine from the universality of reason as an attack on their most profound convictions. A reason which is deaf to the divine and which relegates religion into the realm of subcultures is incapable of entering into a dialogue of cultures. They don't have anything to say, right? At the same time, as I have attempted to show, modern scientific reason with its intrinsically platonic element bears within itself a question which points beyond itself and beyond the possibilities of its methodology. Modern scientific reason quite simply has to accept the rational structure of matter, that platonic element there, and the correspondence between our spirit and the prevailing rational structures of nature as a given on which its methodology has to be based. Yet the question why this has to be so is a real question and one which has to be remanded by the natural sciences to other modes and planes of thought, to philosophy and theology. For philosophy and albeit in a different way for theology, listening to the great experiences and insights of the religious traditions of humanity and those of the Christian faith in particular is a source of knowledge and to ignore it would be an unacceptable restriction of our listening and responding. And here I am reminded of something that Socrates uh, said to Fido. Uh, Fido, uh, this is a, a, a one of Plato's dialogues that takes place uh, after Socrates has been condemned to death and has drunk the hemlock and is discussing with friends uh, the possibility of the immortality of the soul. So a very, uh, a very moving dialogue and one that uh, you know, has all kinds of implications uh, both for philosophy and, uh, and for its consonance with, uh, with religion. In their earlier conversations, many false philosophical opinions have been raised. And so Socrates says, it would be easily understandable if someone became so annoyed at all of these false notions that for the rest of his life he despised and mocked all talk about being. But in this way he would be deprived of the truth of existence and would suffer a great loss. The West has long been endangered by this aversion to the questions which underlie its rationality and can only suffer great harm thereby. The courage to engage the whole breadth of reason and not the denial of its grandeur. This is the program with which a theology grounded in biblical faith enters into the debates of our time. Not to act reasonably, not to act with logos, is contrary to the nature of God, said Manuel II. And according to his Christian understanding of God in response to his Persian interlocutor, it is to this great logos, to this breadth of reason, that we invite our partners in the dialogue of cultures. To rediscover it constantly is the great task of the university. To rediscover logos is the task of the university. And I would say the, uh, the key word there perhaps is rediscover, that uh, this, uh, this, the, the love of truth, the love of uh, the word of God has always been uh, since the time, you know, certainly of uh, uh, Plato and Socrates, the time of the New Testament, you know, has been uh, 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 a guiding uh, principle of uh, 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 
Western thought. And when we look at uh, the perennial philosophy, the philosophy of Plato and Aristotle, of Augustine and Aquinas, again, in each generation, we find people rediscovering the truth that, uh, um, that they, uh, the, the, uh, that they sought to, uh, 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 to discover. But it's one, it's a task for each generation to uh, rediscover it for themselves in the context of their own times, in the context of their own uh, intellectual atmosphere and abilities. Um, but uh, the, uh, the Logos is always there, always calling us to, uh, to come into that dialogue with truth, that dialogue that, uh, that we can uh, 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 discover uh, not only uh, how to reason with one another, but also discover uh, how to reason with God and how to love God. So that's uh, Benedict's um, Regensburg Address. And you can see it's um, one that's really almost a, uh, a, a little course in philosophy and, uh, and the history of Western philosophy in itself, although it uh, touches on uh, you know, many different themes and you know, certainly addresses itself to uh, you know, the modern you know, intellectual uh, atmosphere and uh, you know, the problems and especially those problems of you know, the philosophy of science and uh, the foundations of theology in, uh, in the modern world. So, I think, um, <laughs> as I said, these, uh, you know, these, these uh, Cardinal Ratzinger discussed these, um, these themes uh, all throughout his work. Um, especially, as I said, in uh, the introduction to Christianity for those who want to delve deeper into it. And if you're interested in a philosopher's um, analysis of the Regensburg Address, uh, Father James Shaw, who taught philosophy at Georgetown, has a little book on the Regensburg Address, which uh, is uh, you know, worth a read, I think. Uh, has some prov provocative thoughts to it. So, any any questions? Any thoughts? Yes. So, uh, we were going to use the truth Yep. <laughs> well, I never thought of Martin Luther as a New Age kind of guy, but <laughs> you may have something there. <laughs> it's an, an interesting perspective. <laughs> Where was it? Can you bring back that picture of the bikini? Uh, I don't know if everybody had a, had a chance with this. But what it, can everyone read what it says here? Yeah, okay, so. As I said, it's a little, uh, little feminist humor there, so. It's the right? That's right, yeah. Well, as I say, you know, you get you get feminist you get feminist in all cultures, right? You know, and uh, uh, you know, and uh, and so you know, it's possible for a, a Muslim woman who's completely you know covered up to look at you know the women in the West and say that they're victims of the patriarchy because they're you know they're they're dressing you know provocatively like that, yeah. whereas you know the Western woman thinks the Muslim is a victim of the patriarchy. So again, this is, you know, this dialogue of, of cultures that, uh, 
you know, is going on today. And, you know, sometimes dialogue is, <laughs> is difficult, right? <laughs> Yes, Francis. That's right, yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, the patriarchy can't win no matter what, that's right. <laughs> yes, Loretta. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Jeff? Plato versus Aristotle. Uh -huh. The Union Cap is like the difference between the two that would attract, you know, Aquinas versus the Socrates, you know, like what was the distinction between the uh well was it too much to no, but I, I uh, the, uh, I mean, Plato, uh, well, Plato was a student of Socrates and, and Aristotle was then a student of Plato. And, uh, and actually, if we go back to, to that beginning slide, the School of Athens, the uh, uh, Raphael's famous fresco, you see Plato pointing up because Plato, uh, uh, thought that reality was contained in um, uh, uh, w w what he called forms, which were intellectual ideas, not material reality. And so, w but, you know, what was the relationship of the forms to matter? And Aristotle famously, well, there's some debate as to, you know, what, but Aristotle is pointing straight ahead this way. I don't know if we can go back to that first slide, Michael. But, um, but Aristotle thought that the forms were you know, implicit in matter. Uh, whether he separated them is kind of a debate among Aristotelian scholars. But um, so w why they, I mean, and, and I think you know, it, it wasn't, I mean, um, Unfortunately, you know, uh, the works um, of, of the Greek philosophers were, were lost for a period. And in Augustine's day, Aristotle was, was known only, you know, very Im, Im, imperfectly. So he was far more influenced by Plato and by the Neoplatonists at that time. When you get to Aquinas, uh, Aquinas knew Aristotle quite well, uh, um, as well as Plato. And you can argue, and I think most, <laughs> um, most Thomistic scholars at any rate would argue, that uh, 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 Aquinas gives a, you know, a very uh, profound synthesis of uh, Platonic and Ar Aristotelian thought. But, you know, but those are, you know, the, um, uh, but I mean, you know, it's, you know, it, it depends, you know, some people, you know, separate them more, you can, you can't really see it too well in, in this, uh, but, you know, there, there are Aristotle and Plato right in the very center of this school of Athens. Um, but there, but I mean, I think there's, there's, a large continuity between, um, um, be, you know, uh, you know, within their thought, and the differences are uh, ones that are debated by, you know, um, by specialists in those those fields. Yeah. One more. What? Well, that's probably that's a, that's, a, that's a good way of looking at it. I think yes.
Well, we're, what, what? With the School of Athens, you mean, or? Well, I think what uh, what, what what Benedict w was saying, what he's talking about, uh, the, you know, the the, the self-limitation of reason in uh, the modern sciences and in the university. You know, you're not. You know, you're not. You're you're leaving out what is above altogether, and so I mean, anything that that, that the abstract is. I mean, but again, he's saying, you know, when you look at, you know, material philosophy, when you look at uh, the uh, the natural sciences, they're all based on mathematics, and even the the uh, the social sciences try to be mathematical, um, you know, with more or less success. Um, so, but math, but what is the foundation of mathematics itself? You know, a fascinating question for. Uh, you know, for mathematicians and, and, and philosophers. So that's why, he's, and of course, Plato uh, was, <clears throat> you know, insistent that, you know, that mathematics is the key to, to higher philosophy. Uh, whereas Aristotle would have been, you know, more, uh, more in tune with uh, the, the biological life sciences, uh, the, the things that can, that, that can be observed. So uh, I think, you know, but that, um, uh, that idea that, you know, there's, you know, the abstract and there's also the, uh, the material, how do they come together? How do we understand them? And part of the, the difficulty that Benedict sees in the modern world is that we're cutting ourselves off from the, our historical tradition and also the insights of uh, religion and philosophy which are n not, you know, strictly material or not strictly mathematical, but that are concerned, uh, you know, with ethics, with metaphysics, uh, and um, and so that's, um, you know, I would say there's that, <laughs> that that the last cartoon that we had with the the blank <laughs> the blank space of dialogue is one that needs to be filled in. Yes. Yeah. And the whole, you know, uh, in terms of, it was interesting, you know, but it's not a very good translation because it's its, its own, uh, it has its own anonymity. Yeah, no, so some, 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 some books of the Septuagint are, are almost word for word the same as uh, as the uh, Hebrew, but others are, you know, have more material, or they, you know, have different, uh, uh, you know, they, they uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, have, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, different ways of expressing the same thing. So and so, you know, it is, um, and it's it's interesting. I mean, of course, some of the some of the later books of the Old Testament were written exclusively in Greek, and the uh, the version of the New Testament that, uh, or, the, or the version of the Old Testament that the New Testament writers used was primarily the Septuagint. Well, some of them they may have known the Hebrew, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Well, yeah. At that time, um, 
this, I mean, you have, I mean, so between, I mean, actually, Alexandria probably had a more, you know, lively intellectual life than Greece at, at that point. Uh, was really, you know, the center of the, uh, of the Hellenistic world. Um, uh, so, and Jews would, um, historically, would either be influenced by, by Egypt or by Mesopotamia. The, the Greek influence came through the conquest of Alexandria, uh, but there, um, you know, but Jews, you know, at least, you know, I mean, some obviously probably went to study in, in Athens at some point, but, but that was not a major, so they, they would be more likely to, to be studying in Alexandria. And this is, of, you know, why um, the, the, the translation was done there, why they felt the need for the translation, that uh, uh, the knowledge of Hebrew was, uh, uh, you know, really, it was, uh, it was n not the language of the people anymore. It was, uh, the, and it wasn't, uh, the language of the common people was, was Aramaic. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, in order that, you know, for, to have, and there were Aramaic, uh, what we call targums, which were Aramaic, you know, paraphrases of the biblical books, the Old Testament books. But there was also felt the need for, you know, for those Jews who were, you know, more intellectual or uh, more comfortable in Greek to have their own version. And so that was why this, this project got underway. <laughs> well, well, I mean, you know, they're all, I mean, again, they're all over the place. So, I mean, I think, I think serious, as I say, serious scholars now, whether they're Jews or Christians or whatever, uh, you know, to look, I mean, because actually, uh, you know, the, the earliest, you know, editions of the Hebrew Bible that we have, the, the so-called Masoretic text, uh, you know, come from the... Um, uh, eighth and ninth centuries after Christ. So after, yes, I mean, they were now, they were, uh, they were assembled, I mean, the, the, the Masoretes, you know, uh, uh, assembled them, uh, you know, uh, um, er, earlier than that, but we don't have any manuscripts dating from that time. So that as a critical addition, the Septuagint is much older than any Hebrew edition of the Bible. We do have Hebrew fragments, you know, from inscriptions, from the pyre that have been found, and of course also from the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, but those are hardly complete, whereas the Septuagint is, uh, you know, is the, you know, contains everything that's in the Hebrew Bible plus a lot more. So, uh, so it, ha it is uh, a very important witness to, uh, uh, you know, to the, re um, um, the revelation of the God of Israel. Um, but again, through a Greek lens. And, um, you know, so that, I mean, Hebrew scholars tend to, tend to focus on the Hebrew text, but, but certainly if they're doing critical, you know, work, they're, uh, you know, they, they have to, you know, look at the Septuagint too, and, um, you know, we'll discuss it, you know, in various, but they'll use it in various ways, depending on, but as I say, for, for, uh, for New Testament scholars, it's really uh, the one that, you know, that forms the, you know, the, um, that, you know, that was being used by the, the Jewish scholars at that time. So, kind of an interesting... Um, any other questions? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Mm. 
<laughs> well, I, um, you know, I, I mean, I think there was, um, you know, the, the controversy, you know, kind of blew over, um, you know, fairly, fairly, I mean, fairly quickly, but I mean, I think he, he Benedict certainly touched a nerve, that, I mean, and, um, and maybe, you know, more than he was really anticipating, but at the same time, his basic point was maybe proved by the, the, uh, the violence that erupted, that, uh, you know, that, uh, and, you know, and, and it's, you know, it's, I mean, the, you know, there's obviously a lot that can be said about the relationship between, you know, violence and, and religion, and, you know, how far, you know, can people, uh, you know, be compelled, I mean, you know, ideally, you know, as, you know, uh, Muhammad said, there should be no compulsion in religion, but on the other hand, you know, uh, most religions have, you know, uh, you know, uh, wanted to convert people, or at least, you know, have, uh, you know, been comfortable with doing that. So, so I, uh, but I don't, um, I mean, I, I don't think, um, you know, and, and of course, there was, I mean, that, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the assimilation of, uh, you know, the, uh, the Muslim populations into Europe, which has, you know, been going on now for, you know, s several generations, but it's become more and more of a, you know, problematic, you know, we're having riots in France right now, um, you know, uh, you know, how far this is a, a religious thing, how far it's a cultural thing, how far, you know, you know, you can, you can argue about, but it's certainly, you know, uh, and, and yet it was something that was not really being discussed at all. And so I think by bringing it out, you know, Benedict, you know, uh, did a service to, you know, I don't know how, uh, you know, I guess, um, you know, how, how forthright, you know, politicians, but they're, be, they're more and more so. And um, it's not always a, a pretty sight, but that's, uh, that's uh, but it's a dialogue that, you know, has to take place. And I think he was trying to put it, uh, in, you know, on its, um, you know, um, you know to, to have, you know, to have that genuine, you know, intercultural dialogue, uh, which he talks about, uh, as, um, you know, on the basis of reason rather than in, uh, you know, murdering one another, which is, you know, often the alternative. Okay? Okay, well, thank you all very much. And, and thank you to Kylie for those, <laughs> for those wonderful, wonderful pictures. We, we